next speaker is uh, Grant Parker. I met Grant through Salim not long ago. Grant joined Stanford from Duke University in 2006. He teaches Latin and other topics in Roman imperial culture. He has also worked on the history of collecting, which we chatted about the other day, uh, and which as a digital collector, I find uh, completely fascinating. His books include The Making of Roman India and The Agony of Asar, A Former Slave's Defense of Slavery. His current research projects focus on memorialization and public history in both Rome and South Africa. His talk is titled Mapping Cape Slavery, 1652 to 1838. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, it's, um, and thank you, uh, Leo, for a fascinating paper. Um, that's a very hard act to follow. <laughs> uh, I'm taking you from uh, the modern world to um, the southern point of the African continent, mostly in the 18th century. So please bear with me in the last talk of the afternoon. Uh, so um, I will use this map as my base uh, point. And um, uh, Peter van der Aar is known, shall we say, for the quantity rather than the quality of his mapping. He produced an enormous number of maps. Uh, he was apparently quite indiscriminate in using other people's maps. Uh, nonetheless, uh, for reasons that I hope will become clear, this map is a useful starting point as I try to make sense of uh, enslavement at the Cape of Good Hope in the 18th century via maps. So my comments will have uh, three different sections. I will first talk about the networks, the larger patterns of all of these histories. I will then go on to proximities to more intimate histories, uh, mostly around households. And then thirdly, I would like to talk about the different routes, so a dynamic mapping through this world of the early colonial Cape. But first, with regard to networks, we can also think about the parameters of what's going on here. The Cape of Good Hope, as it came to be known, was colonized by the Dutch in 1652, rather hesitantly. They really didn't want to put down roots there, but mostly they didn't want the, the Portuguese, the French, or the British to, uh, to get that uh, key uh, site that would that allowed them to apply the seaborne route to the East Indies. Um, and uh, so uh, for that reason, uh, the, um, a small settlement was made in 1652. The Dutch did not have good relations with the indigenous uh, Khoi people. And as a result, uh, as the settlement expanded, uh, they realized the need to bring labor from the other colonies throughout the Indian Ocean world. As a result, uh, the largest labor force within the Dutch Cape came from the Indian Ocean world. So when I talk about networks within this, I'm talking about the Indian Ocean world. Now that might be surprising if we think about the Atlantic world, which is much better known in the United States and involves uh, a very, very large number uh, of people crossing uh, from uh, from east to west. Well, the Indian Ocean world uh, has a much smaller number of people at some 63,000 uh, in the, these 180 years or so came from the Indian Ocean world to the Cape. This is a story of people coming to Africa rather than the usual Atlantic narrative of people moving east from the African continent to the Americas. So um, if I spend some time on the the context for this, that's because it's really not very well known. And uh, this, as I will try to show via maps, is the, key, uh, is the key aspect to the networks that we have here. When the uh, settlement was established in uh, 1652 uh, for the first time, uh, the Dutch began very early on to map the uh, to map the settlement. And here we have the uh, settlement of Cape Town. And basically this is a vegetable garden. 
the remnants uh, of which are still in place are called the company's gardens, uh, because it was those vegetables that were the key to the Dutch uh, route from uh, Europe to the East Indies. Okay, so the Dutch needed uh, vegetables and livestock uh, to supply and fresh water, of course, to supply uh, their, uh, their uh, ships coming, applying this route uh, into the East Indies. Uh, and the, it's the spice trade that was super lucrative. That's what they really cared about. You can already see in the 1656 map uh, attempts to consider the, the utility of, um, of this area here. Uh, so um, this side of the mountain and north is over here. Uh, and so this is one of the early sketches uh, that also shows the enormous uh, appetite and uh, capacity of Dutch cartography in this very age. Uh, 1602 is the year in which the Dutch East Indies Company was, was formed. Uh, and this Dutch East India Company, the VOC, really dominated the scene for two centuries, pretty much exactly two centuries until Napoleon uh, came along. And so the Cape should be seen in the, uh, in the context uh, of this Indian Ocean world. And here we see uh, some, um, you know, what a difference a, a century makes. Here are the company's gardens uh, in the um, uh, in uh, 1763. Here we have the company's gardens, um, uh, various buildings that have been uh, built uh, thus far. Uh, D is the uh, place where the slaves live. Okay, this is a building which uh, still exists today. It's it's uh, from the outside unrecognizable from its original role because it's uh, after the end of slavery, it went on to be used for very different purposes. Uh, nonetheless, notice here the proximity um, uh, of the uh, slave lodge, as it came to be called, to the governor's house um, and to the Dutch Reformed Church. Um, so we're talking about uh, a a substantial building to, uh, occupying now one uh, block in immediate proximity to the company's gardens. Um, this uh, famous image uh, by Johannes Rach is one of the very few uh, that survives uh, uh, that shows the, uh, the, uh, the ordinary people. And here, in fact, this is such an ordinary scene. This, the building still exists. This is the uh, town hall. Uh, here's a man uh, relieving himself against a tree. Uh, and here are various people. Um, this is likely to have been uh, an enslaved person because slaves were, in the Dutch colonial period, the main source of labor at the Cape. And here, there seem to be people uh, perhaps uh, selling uh, fruit and vegetables in the town square. Uh, as it happens, this is Green Market Square. It's, the, um, it's where, uh, where a very large open air market uh, sells things uh, f um, f that are handmade. Um, when we think about this Indian Ocean network, it's, um, we have to realize that this was a network also for others passing through. And here uh, is a, an archaeological find that was made off the coast of Cape Town. It was actually a Portuguese boat that was coming from Mozambique heading for uh, Brazil with 500 uh, odd uh, slaves. Uh, of whom 200 perished. They used these, uh, uh, this ballast because human cargo doesn't weigh very much. And so the, uh, this ballast, which is now in the, uh, the National Museum of African and African American History, um, is, um, was used to balance the boat. Well, the boat ran aground. Um, the survivors were sold back into slavery, actually. Uh, this excavation um, is an older excavation, but it was only uh, with new work that it was realized that it was linked to the slave trade. Uh, and this was this excavation was actually done at the time that the National Museum of African uh, American History and Culture was being built. So the uh, excavation was funded by the Smithsonian. 
It's also interesting to realize that some of the map makers were actually world uh, world travelers with the Dutch East Indies Company. Here's uh, Francois Valentin, who uh, wrote about and mapped a very, very wide range uh, of territories. Uh, and uh, here we see uh, his, uh, in fact, uh, this, um, um, this portrait shows his, his uh, international credentials, as it were, with these personifications around him. Uh, this is uh, Valentin's map of the Indian Ocean world, and uh, this is actually a historical version of the very map that I showed you earlier on. And it's, so it's very significant for thinking about the Dutch East India Company. Remember, the Dutch also had a West India Company that was taking care of the, of the Atlantic trade. Both of these were publicly traded companies um, with um, a royal charter. And here is um, Valentin's map of the Southwestern Cape. So Cape Town would be here, the Cape Town settlement would be there. And that is what is, uh, is in the inset there. As the territory expanded, as settlement expanded, it, uh, it embraced the rich agricultural lands uh, around here to the east and to the north. Wheat grows here. And here is another map maker, Johannes Newhoff. Here is his uh, map of the Cape of Good Hope in a British uh, version. Uh, notice here that the bottom right corner actually uh, has a visual representation uh, of an, a young enslaved person. Um, and note the uh, rather relaxed relation uh, between uh, this uh, young slave uh, and uh, the master, presumably, uh, and contrast that with the uh, indigenous Khoi people that are that are shown uh, in the middle of the map. So that is Newhoff, we've had Valentin Newhoff. Uh, and here is a female um, map maker, Elizabeth Fisher, uh, part of a family of uh, map makers. Um, notice in this uh, very elaborate map of, uh, of South Africa, uh, of Southern Africa, uh, where the red arrow is, and that gives you um, uh, Robben Island, that's the island just uh, close to Cape Town. That's where uh, Nelson Mandela spent uh, uh, many years uh, in, uh, in prison. Uh, that um, has the glass in Elizabeth Fisher's map, da uh, de Sklaven in the Kettenlupe, where that's where the slaves walk in chains. Okay, the island, Robben Island was used um, both uh, as... Um, as a leper colony at different points and uh, as a penal colony. Uh, and uh, so um, this suggests that um, a Fisher knew it in relation to enslaved people. This is a very elaborate map, as you can see, that shows a, a, a settlement that was much greater in 1730 than the, the Dutch East India Company had planned in 1652. Here is a map by uh, uh, Willem Ludewijk. Uh, this is a very important map uh, from an, a different part of the Indian Ocean world. This is the first uh, real map of the um, of the uh, of Indonesia, um, of the Indonesian islands. Uh, this shows Cornelis de Houtman's voyage in 1597. And it is uh, shortly after this that the first Dutch travelers, uh, Willem Janssen, uh, are to be uh, are, are touch land in, the, in Western Australia. So this is historically uh, an enormously uh, important uh, work. Uh, this work, this map was actually withdrawn from publication by the, by the Dutch government because uh, uh, this, uh, this, was, uh, inf uh, this was sensitive information. This is, um, this is uh, on uh, Barry Rudiman's uh, uh, um, map site uh, described as the forbidden map because it was withdrawn from publication. But um, Theodore de Brie, uh, he somehow got a copy and he was able to publish that uh, uh, because he was not at that point under Dutch uh, jurisdiction. So this is a very special map for many different reasons. It's very interesting. Um, 
So uh, let's move on to uh, a different kind of speciality that I would like to describe as proximities, okay? So if we zoom in at the level of households, we see uh, a kind of proximity, and I'll give you an example from this very map from Peter van der Aar. One such household is Vergelegen uh, Estate. Uh, this is, um, uh, well, nowadays about a, a hundred and... 20 kilometers or so outside uh, of Cape Town. Uh, this is an estate that was built by the governor, Willem Adrian van der Stil. He built it with state funds and uh, the, uh, the burghers were very upset about this and they reported, they reported um, Willem Adrian van der Stel to the company and eventually van der Stel was, uh, was dismissed from his post as governor because of his use of state fund to build this very elaborate estate. The, the uh, Dutch East India Company, the Hira 17, the 17 uh, regions uh, of the company uh, decided that this lab a state of Fergelechen should be burnt to the ground as a, as a lesson that nobody should use state money for their private estates. Um, and here you can see that um, uh, Burchardt's map of quite closely matches the, uh, the, uh, the cartouche of, um, of, um, of Van der Aas, except for the uh, indigenous people in front, actually, uh, but the background certainly does, and the lay the overall layout. Well, uh, this uh, was not actually uh, carried out, and in fact, it still exists uh, today. Um, the reason that Burchardt's mapping of this is especially interesting is that it was Burchardt uh, who, as an employee of the company, took with him the letter of petition from the burghers against the governor. Burchardt took it with him in his, in his luggage uh, on his journey back to the Netherlands. Uh, and it was Burchardt's, uh, this uh, petition that led to the firing uh, of uh, Willem Adrian van der Stel over this estate that that's still uh, uh, is in existence today. It's now uh, was bought by Anglo-American who uh, obviously uh, spared no expense in making it look nice. Uh, and here is a map from the time of the, uh, of the renovations. Uh, here we see uh, at the red arrow, uh, the uh, location of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of the slave lodge. Um, the, the larger estates such as Fergelechen would have a separate building for their slaves. I think it, would, it corresponds to that one. Whereas in smaller uh, Dutch estates, the slaves would sleep in the kitchen or they would sleep uh, in uh, just the, the general barn belonging to that estate. This is a reconstruction of uh, the, the uh, archeologically excavated barn at Fergelechen. Uh, by Peter Laponder, um, and here, um, and he did this reconstruction on the basis of the maps, actually. Um, to take the case of another famous Cape um, estate here is Groot Constantia. At the back of this barn, um, this uh, Groot Constantia was built by Willem Adrian's father, Simon van der Stel, uh, the first uh, real governor of the Cape. Uh, in 1685, uh, these steps at the back are, are popularly known as the slave steps. They were um, the, um, but um, so we don't actually have slave quarters there, but they are signs of slavery within this. These. This is a recent uh, map from the time of the reconstruction uh, and uh, ex renovation there. Um, and uh, moving further afield, Swellendam uh, has uh, this uh, building uh, that was used by the magistrate. And uh, it's, oh, it's in the barn at the back that they've tried to recreate, uh, recreate the place where the slaves would have stayed. Uh, this doesn't seem to have had its own slave lodge. Um, when I talk about proximities, I'm talking about this kind of situation where enslaved and uh, enslaving, uh, enslaved holding uh, people uh, are sharing the same space in physical uh, proximity. Uh, this uh, might have an intimate aspect, it might have an intimidating aspect, depending who you ask, depending whose account we have. There may be, and there very often was, we know, uh, uh, abuse uh, as, as 
involved in that, whether it was sexual abuse or, or other kinds of physical violence. Uh, but let us think about um, proximities there as well. Um, uh, the third uh, element that I would like to mention uh, has to do with roots. Now, if we think about roots through the uh, Dutch colonial Cape, we might think immediately of François Le, Le Vaillant or other famous travelers. And I put in Le Vaillant quite intentionally because uh, we have discussed uh, uh, this particular uh, traveler and I hope we can have a, a, a future conversation about him um, and uh, because this is such a fascinating uh, map. But were there other kinds of travelers that we, uh, we come up against that uh, are very co closely connected to uh, the world of enslavement? Uh, so he, in this book, you will find a number of legal documents from trials involving slaves. Okay, these are slave trials uh, fr uh, drawn from the criminal court records of the of 18th century uh, Dutch Cape. Uh, and so uh, I've worked with some uh, colleagues uh, to, to do the best we can with these records. These are, these are trial records. And uh, this is a heat map that shows where these trials take place and where we can pinpoint a time and a place for the individuals mentioned in the in the trials, uh, trial documents themselves. Um, and um, to take one example of perhaps the most geographically interesting of these cases, uh, we have a case in which six people uh, escape uh, mostly uh, different uh, estates and they seek the land of the Khazars. So they were seeking to get to the outer limits of the Cape Colony. They were seeking to go eastwards. The route they took uh, is just south of the Cape Folds Mountain. Uh, and uh, it uh, rather uncannily coincides with the highway, the highway, the N2 highway, um, where explaining, of course, uh, explained, of course, by the, the natural features of the landscape there. Uh, well, they, they go through these places that are mentioned in the legal trials, uh, and they stop at different farms. Now, if we can find the, the, the maps of the farms from the time, uh, we, we, can, we can actually map those journeys quite closely. And I've worked with a student, um, uh, Fiona Clunen, to do exactly that. And we've come up with, uh, with quite a lot. Uh, there's some uh, uh, interesting documents involved in this escape journey that uh, goes quite badly. Uh, we can find some very interesting um, uh, 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 cadastral information about a particular uh, farms. Um, and if, uh, this is a, a, a remarkable, uh, a very detailed map from the, um, uh, that actually gives us a much higher level of detail than we otherwise get. And so we're able to, to identify the roots uh, to, uh, with a great degree of accuracy in many cases. And this is what we've come up with. Um, I should have uh, indicated on my slide that uh, the, the, the base map at the bottom is of uh, Friedrich von Buchenröder, a map from the 1780s. This is a very detailed one. And this, when we put this on our website, uh, we will use uh, Buchenröder's map. Um, so yes, we could also think about uh, roots, for example. We know that one of the very few slave rebellions started here in the Wheatlands to the north um, of, uh, of Cape Town. Uh, this uh, character, Louis von Mauritius, um, uh, this is a modern artist's idea of what he looked like. We have no idea what he looked like. We only know that he had heard of Toussaint Louverture. He made common cause with a bunch of Irishmen uh, at the wine shop of uh, his owner. And uh, these, Ir these two Irish uh, uh, soldiers uh, were part of this conspiracy to march southwards uh, towards Cape Town to gather as many uh, slaves as they could and to present a case at the Castle of Good Hope. They got all the way uh, to the castle, uh, but they were, they were killed uh, there. And uh, th 
well, uh, to, to wind up the story, uh, slavery ended in 1834, first with a period of uh, four years of apprenticeship. Abolition took place on the 1st of December, 1838. Um, it was not the end of discrimination uh, and suppression, of course. The aftermath are very profound in some ways, still visible today. Uh, so this is a very rare uh, visualization of that moment and in, in some ways uh, misleading. But um, it is interesting to think, uh, and this is uh, the uh, famous Arrowsmith map that became the uh, real, um, the gold standard for later mapping um, and that really used uh, the, uh, the Dutch maps um, for British, uh, for British authority now, um, and um, here's an example of a different kind of route. Uh, people um, newly freed uh, left the farms and uh, gravitated towards the mission stations that churches, that mission churches had established um, uh, right uh, uh, at this time. And so the new settlements, so uh, emancipation basically sets in motion new routes. Um, and this is one of the mission stations. It's quite out of the way, so it's not very well known. Um, I'm very interested in working with that museum, actually. It's historically very, very interesting. So these are different kinds of routes, not just of the famous travelers, but of others uh, uh, around the history of enslavement. So um, these are three different kinds of spatialities uh, uh, that uh, require us to look at these Cape maps uh, from different uh, points of view. And I'll end it at, with that. Thank you very much. Bill, we have a question. Um, thank you. You said that the early Dutch who started the Cape Colony brought slaves from Mozambique and other places by ship. Did they also try to enslave the local people that were, that were, that were living at the Cape area? Uh, no, the initial attempts were to use the local, uh, the indigenous people, the Khoi people whom they called Hottentots. Uh, that was not very successful. And for that reason, the Dutch turned uh, right away to their colonies throughout the Indian Ocean. So pretty much in equal measure, um, East Africa, Madagascar, uh, South Asia, especially Sri Lanka and Bengal, and um, the Indonesian archipelago. So basically uh, a Creole community, if I can use that word uh, loosely, uh, was created from the amalgam uh, of uh, people coming from very, very different origins throughout the Indian Ocean world. They decided the local Khoi people were not, were not going to be good slaves, I guess. Uh, yes. The other thing is that the Khoi um, were able to survive from the land uh, in a way. And so they did not uh, need the, they didn't need to work for uh, the new uh, settler uh, arrivals. And in fact, uh, what happened, um, one reason escape was so difficult is that is that uh, people that were not used to living off the land had enormous uh, difficulty. And so uh, if a, a slave escaped from, their, their, um, fr uh, from uh, a particular farm, they would, they would have to raid farms, they would have to steal a chicken now and then, they would have to try to make contact with uh, people that were uh, slaves elsewhere. Um, and when, uh, uh, so, the elaborate journey of Augustus van der Kaap and others in 1786 that failed because they were unable to, uh, to sustain themselves. I'm very impressed by your pronunciation of the Dutch. <laughs> Thank you. Um, could you compare how enslaved peoples were treated in uh, Cape Colony compared to uh, this in the United States in the mid 18th century? Um, thank you, that's a, that's a very tricky one. <laughs> uh, the usual view is that uh, um, Cape slavery was benign and uh, everyone got on terribly well. <laughs> um, where um, uh, obviously that view has been challenged as being uh, rather one-sided. We know much more from the, the uh, settlers and the farmers uh, about that. 
Um, and in fact, these trials show uh, a very, very high degree of violence and abuse um, in f uh, things like um, people being broken on the wheel, for example, uh, and um, left to die um, without the coup de grace, uh, being the bones broken from the bottom up. Um, so there was a, an enormous amount of violence within this, including gender-based violence. It's very, very hard to, to get the overall, to, to, to do some kind of uh, ac uh, accounting uh, of all of this. Um, the, but a key point is that uh, the scale of the economy at the Cape was much, much smaller than that uh, of the U.S., uh, yeah, the, the southern United States. And so uh, the, you wouldn't find the large numbers of slaves in the single estate in the same way. Um, whether that meant better or worse treatment, it's, it's very hard to make a, a general assessment. Um, the, the, what I'm trying to do with my colleagues is to, is to really do a qualitative uh, sampling to, to, uh, to harvest as many stories as we can, as stories that are implied uh, rather than explicitly uh, relayed in the trial. So each, each trial has an elaborate scenario, and so we're trying to make a story out of that. And in fact, we're actually working with... Um, uh, we're working with actors, so um, uh, I'll be speaking next week with a, with an actor whom uh, who I uh, hope will uh, create a monologue out of one of the the trial documents that shows a great deal of internal debate within uh, one of the slaves facing trial. So that's not a, a, a that's a very evasive answer to your question, but at least it's an explanation why uh, I don't feel that I can answer it. Thank you. Thank you. This is a, a really fascinating talk. Um, my question picks up on a couple of different things. One, you're mentioning um, the, the route of the escaped slave being determined by uh, the geography of the region. Um, and then also noticing throughout your talk that some of the maps, you know, as is, uh, are decorated with animals, with local flora and fauna. And I'm just wondering about if you could say a little bit more about the ways that the the landscape or the natural geography or the natural world um, sort of is is in part um, is involved in these stories. Thank you very much. Uh, the I think the key point is that this is a landscape which is actually very hard to uh, uh, that makes it um, it's well. Let me, let me try again. Um, parts of this landscape are agriculturally rich. On the other hand, uh, it's, it's very hard for some uh, person who is on the run from the law to sustain themselves from it. If you're very good at fishing, um, yeah, that wouldn't help you very much, actually, because, <laughs> you know, there, uh, there are some rivers, but not that many. Uh, and from... Um, and uh, uh, the sea, well, uh, yeah. So uh, basically it's very hard to, to live off the land unless you know it very well. And so what we see is that some of the escaped slaves, they, uh, they join uh, Khoi groups uh, and basically they integrate with those groups and some of them, they might intermarry and that's, you know, that's the end of the story. Uh, so um, one of the difficulties in talking about these different groups is that they are highly fluid. <laughs> so um, even the difference between the pastoralists, um, the, the Khoi and the um, hunter gatherers, the, the sand people who were uh, the, uh, who were in this part of the world uh, long before the, the Khoi and were driven into the desert areas. Um, it's, uh, it's people, scholars are very divided about whether these are, these are two different groups or whether they're different aspects of the same group. So, so basically these ethnonyms are very troubling, are very problematic. Um, we do see that um, um, that basically it's the Khoi that are able to live off the land. Uh, and um, so um, 
for the uh, for slaves escaping, they either have to to uh, to get help secretly at night from uh, from uh, people that are still uh, enslaved in in farms, or else they have to basically put in their lot with the the koi. What's interesting about this map is that these uh, these six. Uh, uh, this group of six really tried to get to the end of the Cape Colony. They thought that if they got to, to the land of the Kaza in the Eastern Cape, they would be free from the power of the, uh, of the colony um, and presumably also of the Khoi people. And they thought that they'd have a better chance with the Kaza people in the Eastern Cape. All right, we have time for one more question. Yes. Uh this is a perfect question to really end the, the, the session and mm. really, um, the conference in a way. Um, so this question is for many, if not all of the speakers. Um, and this is uh, very apropos. It's Nick Canis, a longtime uh, California Map Society member and very active. Um, uh, he asks, several speakers today have mentioned the increased di digitization of maps and digital map collecting. What impact will this activity have on hard copy map collecting in terms of stimulating it versus signaling its demise, prices, et cetera? So um, <laughs> we've used images a lot today and they're all scans. Um, and so maybe Grant, you can take a stab and then, um, yeah, you, you know, Rachel, Ron, yeah. Okay, well, I'm probably the least qualified to answer this, but it seems that there's a mic in front of my mouth, so let me try. <laughs> so um, I suppose uh, as a scholar, what I'm trying to do is to um, get access to as many uh, maps as possible that can shed light on the histories that I care about, which uh, is the early colonial Cape in the Dutch period. Uh, some of these maps have been of interest to collectors, and um, you know, I I, uh, I mentioned some of the map makers that will be familiar to you, but some of them are really uh, they're cadastral maps, and they're stuck in government archives, uh, being looked after by people who um, might not realize, might not understand why an old map is important. Uh, because they're interested in contemporary land claims. Um, in fact, in South Africa today, um, uh, land claims are probably the hottest political issue, if you can believe that. So for South Africans who are not interested in maps per se, um, uh, ownership of the land is the most burning issue. I come as, as a historian, my interests are already as a tangent at a tangent, um, uh, collectors would have a different perspective. So all I would say is that um, if you can, uh, I've just mentioned very, very different uh, constituents are having d very different perspectives on the access to maps um, and the ownership of paper maps. And uh, I've completely, uh, you know, I have nothing to say about the paper map. Uh, uh, so uh, you can understand why, thanks. Well, actually, I wrote about this in my president's letter in the uh, Columbia. And uh, to me, there is something very special about having the original map 200, 250 years old. And um, that makes it very, uh, uh, very desirable for me. If I were interested in just the information trans transferred by the map, That'd be a different different story, uh, but to get to the next question, I know that the world of map collecting has sustained uh, some considerable loss in value from maybe five or six years ago. So, uh, caveat emptor. <laughs> so, did you want to make any comments? Yeah, I was going to say I'm I'm extremely unqualified to answer this question. I, I'll say from my own experience as a researcher, um, half of the materials that I talked about today, I encountered as physical objects in the archive, part of albums um, at the Huntington, but then also, you know, on the other hand, uh, the, the sort of wonderful stitched together digital version of the WPA 
uh, map of San Francisco. And so I'm sort of used to, as a researcher, navigating between those two types of materials and have you know great affection for both. Um, just speaking on a personal note, um, I have a bad habit when I go to archives of somehow asking for the largest thing possible to be brought to me. And um, that often presents a lot of problems, both you know, for the, the curators and archivists who are generous enough to bring those things out, but then also they're often very fragile objects. And so, I don't know, really uh, uh, sensitive to the, the need to preserve those things and the you know extreme difficulty things like I mentioned um, the Edwards scale map, which is somewhere in a warehouse that are almost too big to be kept anywhere. So um, I don't know, this is just a series of reflections, but yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I should just quickly mention, um, uh, I think as a librarian and as someone who supports research, um, this, one of the things we do here, speaking to what you've just said, uh, is we uh, deliberately uh, find the larger maps to scan on a routine basis because they're so hard to bring out. And, and if you have it on, on the big screens, particularly here, you, the, the, you know, the paper map, um, is, is, is important. Uh, we here, of course, really want uh, the, the users to use the paper, and the physical and the digital. Uh, both are extremely important. Uh, there's certain, something visceral about the paper, the smelling, the feeling, the touch, uh, you, you know, um, and sometimes not everything is scanned, back of the map, that sort of thing. So, um, but I should also quickly mention um, that um, Yes, uh, there are some, the prices have gone down the last few years, but prior to that, I think one of the things I should mention is that because maps have been scanned and available, there is certainly a large group of people who want to see the real thing. They want to have, grab, ha, hold, uh, you know, hold the real thing and maybe purchase the real thing. So there's some, there's some other things going on as well. So, great. I think we should be, I think we should probably we should, wrap okay. up. It's it's uh, we're, we're we're over time. Um, Grant, I wanted to thank you very much for speaking to us. It was really wonderful. We appreciate it. And um, and then I want to wrap things up. Thank everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you in the cloud, everybody who came virtually. Thank you to the Rumsey Center, uh, and thank you to all of our speakers. This has been wonderful. Uh -huh.